Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday School. I'm glad you're here. Let's jump into the Gospel of Mark. So if you've got your Bibles, grab your Bibles. Put your handout on the table today. Uh, we're starting with verse 4 in Mark. So we'll go ahead and read through. I already got to start again. Uh, we'll go ahead and read through uh, Mark chapter 1. And um, I, I just, I'll be honest with you. We may or may not get to Mark today. So... Like, so I'm going to read chapter 1 because we have to introduce somebody today and I don't want to skip past that quickly because this, this person is rather important in the Gospel of Mark. So let's read through, uh, well, I almost picked up my Greek New Testament to read. I was like, nope, can't do that. So uh, there we go. All right, Mark chapter 1. At the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness, and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him, and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching and they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits that they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve him. That evening at sundown, they brought in all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, for this, that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to freely talk about it. 
and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. I love Mark's gospel. They just jump in, here we go. And you don't get too many verses into Mark before you realize that we are introducing a brand new character. Now, we've, this is our uh, fourth week in the Gospel of Mark, and we're looking at starting at verse 4 today. So I'm pleased with our pace. Uh, but we introduce a new character at this point. And uh, what's the new character that we see in verse 4? It's John. All right. Now, John appears doing something and saying something and being introduced in a way that if we don't have a little bit of context, it might just feel like well, we, we just dropped a new player onto Fortnite and you know now the game's got this many players, right? It's just, it's totally like, you know, what, who is this person? So let me ask you a question. Uh, where in the Bible do we find a little background on John? There's a little background in Matthew, right? Anywhere else? Yes, Luke, right? Uh, guess what chapter in Luke? Chapter 1, that's right. So let's head over to Luke chapter 1. Now, I will, I will uh, preface our reading of Luke chapter 1 with this comment. Um, it is okay to read the Bible texts that have something to do with the birth of Jesus when it's not December. Like, we have permission to do that. I know, right? What is this thought that has come into our heads here? Right? So, um, so Luke's gospel, and, and Luke is almost the opposite of Mark. Luke is the guy that's going to pack as much detail and as much content and as much context into his narrative as he can get. And, and you know, Mark, we talked about, we're kind of skipping a rock across the surface of the details. And Luke is all about the details. So if you look at uh, if you look at Luke chapter one, so the first few verses are this dedication. He's talking about why he's writing, and then that your your Bible may have a section heading starting at around verse five. What is what is the section heading of verse five? Birth of John the Baptist. Yeah, that's a, we're talking about John the Baptist, right? Now, who's Luke's gospel fundamentally about? Right, and who does Luke start with? John. Who did Mark start with? Before John? We talked about it last week. It's open book. Who did Mark start with? Isaiah. Isaiah. That's right. You start with Isaiah. Like Mark's going to introduce the guy that's going to introduce the guy that's the guy. Right? <laughs> it's, it's a lot of introducing. It's this, because Mark is trying to build up to help us realize this is the one that we've been looking for. So Luke's gospel, let's look at uh, chapter 1. We'll start reading in verse 5. And when you hear something, and it might be a couple of verses before we get there, but when you hear something that sounds like something we have talked about in Mark, hold your Bible up. Okay, so here we go. In the days of Herod, this is Luke chapter 1, verse 5. the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abiah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just have to chuckle at these things because, duh. Right? <laughs> and the angel said, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, 
and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man. I really want to stop there and gripe a little bit about how we complain when God tells us something, but we'll just keep going. And my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. I've got a feeling that Gabriel didn't take a lot of smack from anybody. <laughs> right? I, I have trouble reading this. Uh, I'm Gabriel, and like I stand before, like, you know, like God. And no, 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 no. There's, there's no hesitation or stuttering here, right? Gabriel is very clear. Verse 21, the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. When he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived. For five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among people. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. And this is usually where we start reading in Luke chapter 1 because we want to get straight to Jesus. But that's not where Luke started. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the same and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, I wonder if Gabriel ever got tired of saying, will you stop being scared of me? Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is a lot of news all at once, okay? Like, this is a lot. Because at this point in Israeli history, a lot of people call this the quiet intertestamental time, the 400 years where, uh, and, and some people inaccurately say God wasn't speaking. God was speaking. He didn't use a prophet to write it down and it become canon, but God is always speaking to his people. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, so now we're collecting the, the dots that Luke just introduced, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You notice Mary's response, how it's different than Zechariah's response? <laughs> Mary gets to speak because her response is different than Zechariah's response. So verse 39. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary. Now I want you to focus on a couple of words here because these are really important. Because there's been a whole bunch of garbage in the news this past week about things that are evil and wicked. And I want you to see the words that the Bible uses to describe human beings who have not yet been born. What is the word? The baby leaped in her womb. Okay? So we're all on the same page here. The baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord 
should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby, and who is this baby? This is John. Leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, and this is some of the most beautiful poetry in the entire Bible, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. So she's connecting the fact that even though God hasn't had a prophet in the last 400 years, he's still working through these generations. When we skip over the genealogies, we skip over the fact that God is developing and working through and remembering his people even through these quiet times. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy and has spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So for those of you that are not paying attention, Elizabeth is six months pregnant at the beginning of the conversation. She stays there for three. So, Luke, here's your math question today. What is six plus three? Nine. nine, right. And after someone has been pregnant for nine months, guess what it's time to do? Yes, get, the baby needs to come, <laughs> right? Okay, so here's what happened. Verse 57, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth. See, Luke is a doctor. He's aware of that. He's helping us connect these dots. And she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet. And he wrote, his name is John. Now, why would he have to use a writing tablet to communicate his name was John? Why, Lou? He can't speak. Now, how many months after this was this that he wasn't able to speak? Nine. So, so think about this. You don't get to talk for nine. Like, you, you, like talking has been normal. This is normal in your life. And now we're going to put pause on talking for nine months. And oh, by the way, he couldn't text either, right? They had to bring him a writing tablet, and he had to write out his name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke. <clears throat> Blessing God. Now, there'd be a lot of us that would go, uh, I'm pretty angry right now because this took nine months. No, no, no. His son is here. This is a beautiful day in the life of an Israeli boy. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. Here you go. Now pay attention to Zechariah's words. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and that from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him with all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Is that familiar to anybody? Yeah. Now, what was Zechariah's role? What was his job? Did they pick up on it in early in the uh, early in the chapter? He was a priest, right? 
Would the priest be expected to know something of the Old Testament? Yes, the priest would be expected to know a great deal about the Old Testament. Do you think it was accidental that the Holy Spirit filled Zechariah and he quotes a prophecy that Zechariah knew exactly who it was talking about? Zechariah knew exactly that this is the person who will introduce the Messiah. And I don't know if it was in this moment. But he realized that God had not forgotten his people. And it was going to happen through his family. It's like, what in the world? This is beautiful. Like, holy cow. He picked us for this. And he's had to stay quiet for nine months about this, right? <laughs> it's beautiful. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunshine, the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in dark places and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. And don't miss verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Now let's go to Mark chapter 1. So this is the backstory before we get to verse 4. So who knew about John? Now, stop at this point, go to your paperback Bible, go to the back of it where I told you to put your map, and find Judea. If you don't have a map, I have maps on the podium right over here, so hop up and grab one. Or two. Or however many you need. It's okay. So I was talking with Ms. Kay before class started this morning, and uh, so many of you have figured out that we have started uh, recording our Sunday school classes on video. I put them on YouTube, and it's an easy way to catch up if you miss a class. Um, and I, I, I might as well just go ahead and make this very public. I, this is not going to change how we do Sunday school. This is just another tool for people for people to be able to catch up if you miss a week. Um, so if you walk in front of the camera, I really don't care. <laughs> Um, if we bump the camera and it falls over, as long as my iPhone doesn't break, I really don't care. And if it does break, well, then it's time for an upgrade anyway, so it'll be all right. You know, this is just another tool that we use. So um, who knew about John's birth and the irregularity of it back from the end of Luke chapter 1? Who knew? The answer is in verse 65. Yeah, Judea, that, that whole area. So where is Judea on your map? You, you see, so you've got red, and the red words are the areas, right? So Judea is this massive area on the, kind of the lower third of the map. So this includes Hebron and Bethlehem and Bethany and Jerusalem, Mount Olives, Emmaus, Jericho. These might sound like familiar names in the New Testament because a lot of stuff happens around here. So this whole area knew about John. So for a couple of decades, John's been out in the wilderness, which is weird. Okay, And, and Mark introduces him, and Mark says, but what about John the Baptist? He said he was clothed with camel's hair, wore a leather belt around his waist, and ate locusts with wild honey. Well, if you're in the desert, then there wasn't a wilderness. It feels like you're probably going to have an odd diet relative to everybody else, right? But what was John doing out there? Preaching. He was preaching. That's right. And the, the, the Greek word is to herald, to declare something to be true. Um, to say, this is the thing that is right. 
And what was he preaching, Skip? What does the Bible say? Just read. Yeah. Yeah. Baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And he's saying, somebody is coming. Now, the interesting thing is that the Holy Spirit let Elizabeth know through John's reaction in the womb who Jesus was before John knew. Like, it's like he, he didn't have a conscious, rational thought, like, this is the Messiah. I should respond. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit just moved, which is amazing to me. Like, there's a lot going on there. So John has been announcing and, and actively moving because Jesus was near since before he was born. Like, this is a long time. So the, uh, the Sunday that I was ordained to be a deacon here at Stewart Heights, uh, we typically on, on the ordination Sundays, we have the deacons will meet together with the, uh, the new deacons that are coming in, and we'll have a time of testimony. So you get up, you give your testimony uh, about how you came to know the gospel and what God has done in your life since then, and we kind of get to know each other a little bit, right? So there were several of us that were being ordained that day. Uh, Joel Griffith and I were ordained the same day. Uh, Craig Smith and I were ordained the same day. And uh, we, I, I, we, I think we went in alphabetical order. So I was before Craig. And uh, there's nobody in between the, the F and the S. And so I stood up and I gave my typical testimonies. Uh, my name is Jim Fleming. Um, I was brought up in church. The uh, first Sunday that I missed church was the Sunday that I was born. My mom likes to joke that I had nine months perfect attendance before that. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and that's typically the response, right? It says, ah, oh, that's a funny little theological joke, right? There. And uh, my dad was the principal of the Christian school, um, taught Sunday school for decades, uh, grew up. I, the, I learned how to read from the first chapter of John. This is, I, I literally learned my ABCs from the Bible. Um, I was, uh, came to know the Lord at the age of eight uh, and was, have been able to, to sit under a lot of different people who have invested a spectacular amount of time chipping away and carving and shaping and pushing and rebuking and correcting and encouraging uh, so that God could do what he has done in my life and it is a beautiful testimony of his grace. So Craig's up next, right? Craig stands up and he goes, so um, basically everything Jim said, the opposite. Uh, because I didn't, like, the person that I met that told me about Jesus, I met her in a bar. And, like, it, it was, but we didn't go to church. I didn't know where the local church was. And, like, it's just totally, totally different. It, that wasn't John. John's daddy was a priest who was very well known, who had something happen in his life that was extraordinarily public, that put a spotlight on John and his life for his entire life. People don't forget this kind of stuff. So when John starts to preach in the wilderness, people show up. Does this make sense? Because this was not just some random guy that dropped out of the sky who starts saying something that nobody was prepared for. Isaiah got them prepared for him. Zechariah proclaims it, and then John fleshes it out. So when John starts, I'm getting, like, it's just, can you, so when John starts pointing to Jesus, everybody goes, who's that? Like, there's a reason later on in the gospel that John's disciples, some of them leave John and start to follow Jesus. Because John did such a good job selling Jesus that his own disciples left. Like, that's pretty awesome. John was smitten with Jesus. From before he drew his first breath. This is a beautiful story. And when we just skip in and forget to mention how we, somebody got to where they are, sometimes we forget like, there was a context to all of this that the people of Judea knew. There should have been thousands of people that knew. So let's look at the text. Verse 4. We did get to Mark today. That's good. John appeared. <laughs> you see these loaded phrases that we just look like, well, of course John appeared, right? Mark just set him up. He's going to go. Yeah, 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 there's more stuff there. John appeared 
baptizing. This is the Greek word baptizo. It means to dip under or to immerse. It's the same word that uh, if you were going to take a cloth and turn it a different color at this time, you put it completely under something and come up, it is fully immersed in the dye. It is now a different color. This is the present participle active. This means this is uh, continuously ongoing. So this is a uh, repeated, 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 repeated uh, activity that John is doing here. So he's baptizing in the wilderness. Why would he baptize in the wilderness? That's where he was, right? Why do we do what we do? It's half the time it's because it's where we are. Right? He's baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming. You see the present participle active? He couldn't shut up about Jesus. He kept <laughs> proclaiming this baptism of repentance. And this repentance is this reversal. This, I'm, there's a change here that is taking place. I'm going to go a different direction. This proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, just so we're all abundantly clear, the Greek construction here is not that the baptism was providing the forgiveness of sins. The reconstruction here is that the repentance is providing the forgiveness of sins. So forgiveness is freedom because sin brings bondage. So there is a freedom here from sin. And all the country of Judea. Do you see how Mark flawlessly lines up with what Luke talked about in chapter 1? All the country of Judea and all Jerusalem. Jerusalem was in Judea. We're going out to him. Why? He's yeah, he's baptized. This was this was not a normal thing, right? We'll actually we'll, we'll take a look at this in a, a couple of weeks, I think. Uh, all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized. Now, we'll keep going. All right. We're being, where do you want to start next week, Miss Lisa? Okay, all right. We're, we're going out to him, and we're being baptized by him in the River Jordan. Look at your map. Where's the Jordan? This will give you an idea of where John is in this big, vast area of Judea. See the Jordan? It's kind of running down the middle there. In the River Jordan, why would you want to have a running flow of water in the first century to dip people into? Because a stagnant flow <laughs> is nasty. <laughs> you get this? I mean, this is like just real tight. Exactly, Miss Amy. That's exactly right. The look of like, ooh, I don't think I want to. Like, mm. First person in the baptismal pool? That's cool. 22nd person in the baptismal pool? <laughs> Pass. Like that's human soup at that point, right? I mean, this is like, wow. Oh. And all Jerusalem were going, this is why I don't take baths. Uh, so my showers are God's gift to mankind. And all Jerusalem were going out to him, were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. You didn't get to do this just because it was popular. The confession of sin was the peremptory act before you could be baptized. This is one of the reasons why we have some, when we have somebody in the baptismal pool here at Stuart Heights, we ask them, have you confessed your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Because we want to make sure that we are doing it in accordance with what the Scripture has illustrated to us as an example. Verse 6, Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate. The word ate there is present participle active, so he repeatedly ate. This was not a one-time thing. Sorry. Luke, you want some locusts today? No, you're going to pass. Ava, locusts? No, she's like, no, it's kind of sketchy. Yeah, I think so too. And ate locusts with wild honey, and he preached, he heralded, saying over and over and over and over again, after me comes one who is mightier than I, who is stronger, who is forcible, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy or I am not fit to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water. The Jordan is running behind him. Somebody is wet in the audience, and he is saying, I have baptized you with water, and he will baptize you the Hagios Numa, the Holy Spirit. Jesus is going to have a better baptism than John, and it is going to be fantastic. So, with that, we did get to John. We did get to Mark today. That's good. Cool. 
So we'll pick up uh, next week in uh, your one blank on your handout. And next week we'll start with Mark 1, 9. And Miss Lisa has uh, free reign to back up or to go forward as she sees fit. And we talked about that, so there we go. And uh, we'll go from there. So your homework is at the bottom of page 16 there. Pray for help in understanding Mark. Hear Mark multiple times. Think about Mark day uh, often. Talk with somebody about Mark. Share your insights about Mark. And then invite a member and a non-member. So look around. See who is not here today. Reach out to them. Look around. See which one of your friends that doesn't come to Stuart Heights is not here today. Reach out to them. And then lean in and engage with our weekly update. It's on your table. So pray over those prayer requests. Add any new ones, and after you have prayed, you are dismissed. Thanks for coming to Sunday school today, and I hope you can't shut up about Jesus. Thanks.